Ah, geek out. Hey, and welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. I'm Josh. And we've got a double header of an interview for you this fine July day. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, superstar comic book writer Justin Jordan. Uh, he's uh, here to promote his Image Comic series Spread, which has its 14th issue with new artist John Bivens, who is also on the show. <gasps> yeah, that issue. That's how we do? It's almost pr- like it was planned that way. Yeah. Yes, weeks in advance. Mm. Uh, yeah, with that interview uh, or that the, that book, issue fourteen, is in stores now. It's in stores today, so you have no excuse. God damn it, get that book. Um, you know, the book is very much like you know, Lone Wolf and Cub in a world where the thing from the thing, <laughs> the thing from the, the thing, thing fame, <laughs> yeah, takes over uh, the tremor worms. It's they're fucking great. <laughs> yeah. So, without much further ado, let's have those guys on. And joining us this week, we have Justin Jordan. He's the uh, writer for uh, Spread and the uh, Luther Strode trilogy over at Image Comics. Over with DC, he had written uh, Green Lantern, New Guardians, and uh, Superboy. And uh, yeah, the uh, the 14th issue of Spread should be on uh, out in comic book shops and in Comicsology on Wednesday, July 6th. And the Legacy of Luther Strode, which collects the third and final installment of the Luther Strode saga, should be... On theoretically on the on books on, on the shelves around the same time. Justin, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. So let, let's let's talk spread for a second. So the the kind of impression I get from spread is that it's if the worms from Tremors were put, like taken over by the weird alien parasite from John Carpenter's The Thing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my my usual uh, usual way of explaining it is that it's a lone wolf and cub in a world where John Carpenter's the thing ate North America. <laughs> um, so the, the thing was a definite uh, definite inspiration for uh, kind of the visuals and the body horror aspects of the spread itself. Now, with the uh, upcoming arc, you've got John Bivens on on art instead of uh, instead of the series original artist uh, Kyle Strom. How did that uh, kind of come about? Uh, well, John and I have been friends for a long time uh, and have worked together in the past. We actually did a uh, thing for Zuda back in uh, 2007-ish um, called Rumors of War. Um, so we worked together a long time ago and we've known each other for a long and kept in touch all that time. And John has since done uh, Dark Engine also at Image in the last couple of years. Um, uh, so what happened was is we were we had been having some scheduling difficulties, and because of that, we basically needed to get some more time in there and give give Kyle a time to uh, kind of get ahead on issues and stuff. So I suggested John for the gig, and John was interested. Um, so it all went from there. John happens to have a style that is very much... Uh, a spread friendly kind of style. He he fits well into the universe. It's not going to be a be a particularly glaring sort of change. We've done we do fill in issues occasionally anyhow, uh just to fill in the backstory, although this one is set in the, the story's present timeline. Um and those have also been with the guest artists and stuff and sometimes those are fairly marked difference from Kyle's art style uh intentionally. Whereas with John we wanted something that was a little more seamless. It's not that John's style is I don't think you would mistake it for Kyle's style, but it certainly kind of fits into the same sort of uh, general stylistic quadrant. You had kind of mentioned, so issue 14 picks up where the second trade, which ended at issue 11, kind of picks up, because you had two issues of background issues for, for Molly and uh, and Jack. So this picks up approximately how quickly right after that second story arc? Uh, several weeks. Um it basically, this uh, if you've if you've been reading the book, the main character No was kind of uh, off the table for almost all of the second arc, except for kind of a big damn heroes moment at the very end, um, because he's gotten gotten badly injured in the first arc, um, and since we're in a medical less wasteland, that was bad. Uh, in the second arc, he has uh, he has actually woken up from being in a kind of a fever delirium. Um, and it, and is back in action. So it's a couple of weeks after that to give him some recovery time and be back on his feet again. Is is Meriwether still part of the party? No, no. Meriwether will show up again, uh, but he is uh, he is good. Some of the other characters will, in fact, show up again. You'll see more of the Professor and Vox uh, in the future. Um, this one does. There are characters that we've seen elsewhere in the. Uh, 
in the backstory issues and some of the issues do show up again in this third arc. Now you had kind of uh, you you had cited Lone Wolf and Cub, which is I mean that's one of the coolest like Japanese. I don't know if it qualifies as Grindhouse, but one of the coolest big Japanese seventies franchises, and of course the Thing. How did you kind of come across the story of of, of Spread? How did you kind of break that? Um, well, you know, like most things, there were a couple of different ideas that kind of glummed around together until they they formed into something else. Like one of them was I had been just reading a sort of idea about, or it was a scientific article, actually, and it was talking about basically the ATP cycle, which is part of cellular metabolism, and it's basically how cells produce energy in pretty much everything. Um, and the article was talking about, and I have no idea why I was reading this article, that's <laughs> what happens when you fall down the internet rabbit hole. Uh, the article was talking about that, that the ATP cycle is not the only way that could at least theoretically be done. And there are other, at least hypothetically possible, ways of cellular metabolism that are more efficient than that. Um, and it was hypothetically possible that these had existed uh, in deep history, and just ours happened to be the one that was right for the environment at the time. And, you know, once it had been established all over the world, the others kind of died out. So I sort of took that idea about what would happen if a hyper-efficient alternate ecosystem uh, got unleashed on the modern world. Um, and, you know, I was looking at things like, uh, it was kind of interested to me about how, so we're used to green covering everything. Like, we're at least used to plants being essentially everywhere. Like, certainly outside of cities. That's just what the world looks like for the most part to us. And it occurred to me that that's just, you know, because we're used to it, if that were like flesh, it would be really disturbing. Uh, so, so the spread is kind of also that notion as well. So that was two of the ideas. The other one was just simply thinking that, boy, Lone Wolf and Cub in a zombie apocalypse would be pretty cool. Uh, and I got thinking about that and thought I didn't want to write like a zombie apocalypse sort of story because there's you know there's just so much of that in film and comics particularly you know film and novels and stuff what was the walking dead zombie kind of explosion the last few years i didn't know didn't know that i had anything interesting to add to that uh but i got to be got thinking and those ideas just sort of glommed together and spread was what inevitably resulted i mean it is pretty like there's it the the lone wolf and cub story does kind of lend itself. I guess the only I'm trying to think of any other post apocalyptic stories that kind of have that dynamic. Maybe Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Uh, yeah, uh, and there's there's bits of that in there as well. I mean, the fact that you know Jack is a cannibal is probably uh, probably kind of derived from The Road. Although that's partly all also derived from the idea of how exactly does somebody manage to stay fat in the apocalypse? So. Where there's a will, there's a way, man. <laughs> um, now, with the, uh, I would kind of be remiss to bring this up. Every time we have somebody on here that has like strong horror elements in their writing, I, I kind of have to ask this question: Are you team Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, or Freddy Krueger? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm inclined to go with Michael Myers, with the caveat, sort of, that. <laughs> Honestly, this applies to all three of them, right? But Michael Myers is my favorite. Not that I dislike the sequels, but particularly in the case of the first Halloween, before, man, I'm going to get into the deep horror nerds here, uh, before the, the second movie kind of retcons everything into Laurie Strode being his sister and everything, he's just this inexplicable evil that just sort of shows up and fucks with people and kills them. Like... <laughs> The rest of that backstory, it's actually really creepy. Like, it's effective anyhow. Like, the, the Halloween 2 and stuff doesn't really detract from it. But, like, certainly in the first one, if you if you go in now and watch the first one without that kind of mythology, and there's just, you know, he's just sort of this boogeyman character, it, it, it's just kind of amazingly creepy. And there's bits in it that are just... It's interesting, because there's stuff that's in there that I'm, like, 90% sure is the way it is because of the budget 
of the movie. <laughs> um, but it ends up being way creepier. Like, so they roll up to this asylum in the middle of the night in a storm, and there's just crazy people wandering outside. Like, that's just creepy. Like, and it's creepy in a, like, a oh, holy crap, something really bad has gone down here way. That, like, if they had shown, and certainly Rob Zombie's Halloween remake, you did show it, uh, what had gone on to make that happen, it wouldn't be nearly as effective as what we did see. And there, there are a couple other scenes uh, that are sort of that way. So ultimately, like, I find myself in kind of a Michael Myers guy. I was, it was funny, last night I was literally watching uh, the end of Friday the 13th Part 3 and beginning of Halloween, or beginning of Friday the 13th Part 4, which I haven't seen either one in a few years. Oh, I mean, Dream Warriors, like, the first Halloween... And I, I totally agree with you because up until Halloween 2, the only reason Michael Myers or the only reason Laurie Strode gets on Michael Myer, Myers' radar as far as we know in that film is because she just happens to swing by the Myers home. And then he's yeah. just like, you, I get to follow you for the rest of the movie. Um, and then they kind of dilute that with, with Halloween 2 and then Season of the Witch is its own thing. But yeah, I mean, outside of that first Halloween, Dream Warriors, and to a lesser extent, the Dream Master are just, like, masterpieces. Uh, yes, I, I am still inordinately fond of, uh, of Dream Warriors. Um, the thing about that is, is those, those movies kind of segue, especially the Friday, or not Friday, excuse me, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies kind of segue into not the same kind of horror. I, I, I wouldn't say they're not horror anymore, um... But, like, it's a different kind of horror that is maybe... It's more fun and less horrific to me. Uh, certainly Dream Wars, though. Dream Master is a little... Dream Master is less that way, actually. It's, it's a little more straight horror than I felt like Dream Warriors was. Um, but I, 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 in the case of, of all these franchises, I found the first, or in the case of uh, Friday the 13th, second movie, although the first one's also an effective movie, too. I found the first one or two of those to kind of be my favorite because they're more, they're more pure. For one thing, you know, I'm old enough to, I'm about the same age as Halloween, as a matter of fact. I think it came out in 78 when I was born. Um, but I am old enough to remember being very young and, and Jason Voorhees and the Friday the 13th movies really becoming a thing. Uh, to the point where, like, seeing the trailer for the third and fourth movie was kind of a big deal, and there was going to be 3D and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you go back and look, and I swear, deep horror nerd, if you go back and look at those movies now, a lot of the kind of tropes that come of it are sort of, sort of in their prototype stage there, which is, I don't know, it, it, it appeals to me. There's, there's, there's a kind of purity to them. Yeah, they're the movies um, and that created the them that I sort of dig. Yeah, I mean, uh, like like Chris was saying, they do really kind of create the tropes, especially. I mean, if you think about it, Jason doesn't get his mask until the third film, and like the he end does not. Of the and I uh, well, like in the in the case of all those movies, like there's a very simple, fairly effective mythology. You know what I mean? Like Freddy Krueger was a child monster who got torched. Now he's killing people in their dreams. Like, the other movies start to add more elaboration to the mythology, and that happens to all those series. And I think the more elaboration you add to that mythology, like, on one hand, it's kind of cool, but, like, I think it detracts from sort of the essential scariness of it. Um, you know, in, in, in Friday the 13th Part 2, Jason Voorhees is just this apparently living. He, he evidently survived just drowning because he does not seem to as yet have been an undead creature until the sixth movie. Unlike uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon who does drown in the third installment. <laughs> creature walks among us. When they remove his guilt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, in, in the second movie, he's just kind of a dude that, you know, was born deformed, like, you know... Had a rough time at camp, lost his mother, put their head, you know, on a kind of a sacred thing. You know, the usual. And uh, <laughs> Michael Myers is just this inexplicable evil, you know, he was an evil child and he's an evil adult and there's no particular reason for what he does. And in the case of Michael Myers, <laughs> one of the reasons I like, uh, I like Michael Myers, I think, more is... There's this just weird, dark sense of humor to what he does. Like, it's this combination of, like... He never communicates, but, like, there's definitely signs that he's intelligent and has a sense of humor. 
like so there's something weirdly inhuman about him uh in a way that's not true of Jason and Freddy. Like, Jason and Freddy always feel more human to me. And, and you know, their their crimes are sort of revenge-based, which I think gives them a, a quasi-sympathetic quality, at least understandable. Whereas, you know, and by design, Michael Myers is just evil. But, like, the, the shit about, like, putting on a ghost thing with the guy's dead guy's glasses and stuff, <laughs> like, that's, the there's beer. no reason to do that other than to fuck with people. Like... Yeah. It's just this malicious sense of humor, and, like, he's smart enough to drive a car and stay around, you know, get around this town without really being noticed and all that kind of stuff, but he never communicates. He never, you know, like, like there's this there's this real sense of, like, an alien evil intelligence, not alien in an er- in extraterrestrial sense, but alien in the sense of, like, yeah, he's really not a human being. Like, whatever he is, it's not a person as we would recognize it. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite, speaking of, like, Michael Myers, is one of the things that be kind of became, like, an endearing trait, not endearing, I guess that's kind of weird, <laughs> what I'm about to say, but, like, a trait of his that, like, really kind of changed him, you know, as you're saying, different from Jason and Freddy, is, like, when he kills somebody, like, he admires his handiwork, you know, the head tilt that he always does, which kind of became, like, a thing, just, yeah, little things, like, he's, like, yeah. toying with everybody, and, yeah, yeah, the, and, and a good example, like you were saying, of the fact that he sees the boyfriend in the ghost outfit, puts it on, and then brings the beer and, like, plays along with it, yeah. like, yeah, here you go, and then kills her anyway, you know? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, we, it's just so weirdly, darkly humorous. Yeah. Like, it's not funny in the movie, like, it isn't. But, no. like, it, it's clearly, like, it's some perverse sense of humor exists within him, like, which just makes it, you know, kind of horrific, considering how kind of opaque he is to the audience otherwise. Mm-hmm. I love that. I mean, to tie it back uh, just a little, the, uh, I love that you have the um, the kind of the Kenner toy variants for spread. How did that all kind of come about? Because I have some of those like old school Kenner toys. Like Chris, we're in his home studio, and I see he has one for like Freddy Krueger right over there. Mm-hmm. Um, There's a xenomorph behind it. As oh, well. oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, how did that kind of come about to create the like the action figure variants for uh, for spread? Um, the guy- the guy who does the uh, 3D modeling for those for us, uh, Michael Adams, and he's done a few other things that I worked on. He was doing a doing an action figure variant for the Evil Orny comic that I've got upcoming from Dynamite. He's done one for Strode as well. Um, I just connected with Kyle at some con, and Kyle liked the stuff, and he had kind of mentioned doing it, and then they kind of showed me what it would hypothetically look like. And it was actually before the action figure, uh, the action figure variant trend kind of like became a thing, which it's not, it's not at all that people were like copying us. Like, it's just one of those, something seems to be in the zeitgeist, like, because the others came out without us knowing they were coming out, but so soon after ours that they couldn't possibly have been taking off on us. You know what I mean? Like, they were just sort of everywhere all the time. Uh, but, yeah, I just, uh, that was what action figures looked like, specifically the, the ones for Spreader, specifically modeled on the old uh, old Star Wars toys. Um, and we were able to do it in a way that really looks like uh, action figures, whereas the usual action figure variant is kind of drawn just to look like a cover, whereas ours, if you look at it from five or six feet away, an awful lot of people think it is an action figure and are disappointed when it is not. Um, I'm kind of disappointed kind of now. Of yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it was. I didn't know it wasn't real because you had the 3D model of them in the back matter for both trades, and I was like, "Oh my god, they do exist." <laughs> they do not. Well, no, that's not true. There is a uh, Michael Adams has a 3D printer, so there's a 3D printed version of No that exists. Uh, but the thing is, like, we we could make action figures out of it from those molds. It's just that doing so is just prohibitively expensive that I don't know that anybody's going to be willing to spend, like, 50 bucks a figure on them. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, but uh, you mentioned Evil Ernie, so w- with Dynamite. So is that, uh, do you have a, a, a release date for that, and does that take place immediately after um, Fright Night? Uh, no, that's Evil August. Ed, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, I don't know if it's immediately after Fright Night or not. It's a little little ambiguous in the time frame, uh, how long after, you know, the various things um, it's going on. But, yeah, that should be out It's cool. I'm, uh, as I mentioned, I am right at the age where I was just coming into my teenage years when Evil Warning was originally coming out. And Evil Warning was one of the first few comics 
that I ever came across that was really not Marvel and DC. Um, just because when I, I am from extremely rural Pennsylvania, and when I was growing up, I was, you know, the 80s, when you actually could still easily get um, Marvel and DC comics at grocery stores, gas stations, that kind of stuff, which is where I bought all my comics at. I remember those and, days. Uh, <laughs> and the spin Yeah, and, and, and so, but, but as a result, all I got was Marvel and DC, which is fine, but there is, of course, a whole world of cons, and there was then, too, a whole world of comics out there. So uh, I started going to this independent bookstore when I was around 13, and I got exposed to things like uh, Watchmen and uh, Dark Knight Returns. Actually, it was a couple of years before that, but after that, I started kind of getting into it, and uh, Evil Arnie was one of the first, you know, kind of gore, splatterpunky comics that I saw, and I was I was a horror kid, and I was like, holy shit, you know what I mean, like, I that was something different, so, you know, 25-ish years later, coming around to, to write it myself, it's kind of, kind of an interesting uh, thing, and pretty cool. There's kind of like a symmetry to it. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ask, because I feel like this is right in your wheelhouse, have you seen Turbo Kid? Uh, I saw part of Turbo Kid. I have not watched it in its entirety yet. It is so good. <laughs> if you love those kind of like, I don't want to call them schlock because I <laughs> fucking love them, but if you like those more schlocky 80s movies, it is right. Schlocky. Schlocky, schlocky yeah. <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I just watched um, We Are Still Here, which I did not care for, and... uh it was interesting. I was I was, uh, I was talking to people about the whole concept of doing uh, those sort of homage movies, um, which uh, we are still here is not. It, it's not quite that. And I started to see that's kind of my issue with with we are still here. There's an argument to be made that it is a bad early '80s horror movie by design. Uh, but if so, it's not bad enough. You know what I mean? Like, it, it falls into this middle zone where, like, it's not, like, hitting hitting the mark that it needs to to, like, work as that sort of homage. Um, oddly enough, that's that's also true of uh, Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof, I feel. Um, the thing about Death Proof, uh, and this is a tangent, so I'll try to keep it brief. The thing about Death Proof is that if you were watching that movie as you would watch a 70s exploitation movie, which is that if you go into it with absolutely no knowledge of who's in it or what it's about, it is a much more effective movie than the way literally everyone, almost everyone has watched it. Like, there's this mislead that you think you're going to go into the standard slasher movie and, you know, the kids are going to go to this this beach house and they're, you know, they're having sex and drugs and all this stuff. And then it just takes a hard left into being another related kind of movie. Uh, and, and the second half of it is something different entirely. And, like, if you don't know any of that going in, what Tarantino is trying to do is effective. But, like, otherwise, it is too well made to be effective as the kind of movie I think he intended it to be, which is, like, a weird middle space to be in. Um, and to a certain much lesser extent, I felt like that movie was that way. So, like, what I saw of Turbo Kid, I quite like because it kind of hits into the right level of getting where you want to be with that kind of kind of pastiche. Um, on the other hand, I also watched uh, I watched the horror movie Housebound recently, and Housebound could very easily be a 1980s movie in 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 the best of ways, and. It actually doesn't go for, like, the schlock homage at all. It just somehow gets the spirit of quasi-kid-friendly horror movies from the 80s, uh, which, I, which I thought was a good trick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like Gremlins and Critters and all that. Very much so. Lady in White. Lady in White would actually be what I would probably compare it to, which is a rel- somewhat obscure movie at this point. Uh, do you think Planet Terror suffers from the same thing that Death Proof does? No, I think Planet Terror leans in into what it's doing hard enough to work. Um, and of the two, of the two in Grindhouse, uh, Planet Terror was the one I preferred. I think um, I, I think it really uh, shows because like uh, Robert Rodriguez, like he uh, like watching it. Like I watched the double feature in theaters and like sitting, you know, watching Planet Terror. I'm like, oh my god. Robert R- Rodriguez loves this, and he's like, you know, totally like being like, this is my love letter to these kinds of movies. Whereas Quentin Tarantino was like, I really wanted to make a movie, and my friend Robert had a great idea, so I made a movie kind of like his too. 
At least that's yes. what I saw. Yes, I, I, I think that's I think that's very true. And you know, it's kind of funny because it's not that Quentin Karen Tarantino is by any means incapable of doing uh, homage stuff that works, considering that's largely what his career is probably based on. <laughs> and I don't mean that as a negative thing. Yeah. Um, but certainly, he's capable of, of yanking stuff from various things and mixing and matching it really well. I think Kill Bill's probably the most shining example of his ability to do that. Um, but Death Proof doesn't work, and it should. Like, there's so much about Death Proof that I actually like. It just does not add up into a movie that I want to rewatch. That's a good point, because, like, I, the first time I saw Death Proof, I was, like, on a huge Kurt Russell kick, so I was just buying every Kurt Russell movie ever. Breakdown. Breakdown, man. That's a hidden gem. That's, like, the best. But, um... Uh, nah, man. Soldier. <laughs> yeah, yes. that's right. Yes. But the funny thing about... about Bra- Have you seen Breakdown? I did. Okay, yeah. The funny thing is, I was buying... I was, like, at an FYE or whatever, and I was buying... I came up with, like, Death Proof and, you know, Escape from New York and L.A. and just a bunch of... Tango and thing, Cash. Tango and Cash, which I bought, like... I've bought that movie, like, three or four times throughout my life. I love it. <laughs> cross-dressing Kurt Russell I mean it's the best but like <laughs> I had the stack and the guy when I was buying it it was almost like he was like this like weird drug deal he was like hey man you've ever heard of Breakdown and I was like no he's like follow me you're gonna want it and I was like all right <laughs> and it was like three bucks so I was like whatever put it on the thing and I just I never heard a breakdown before and I watched it and I fucking loved it it was just amazing but anyway so uh, Death Proof was in my stack and I had never watched it and like you were saying I had I had no idea what it's about really I just knew that it was this double feature thing they tried and so when I watched it for the first time, I really loved it. Like I, you know, because I, I had no idea what they were going for. The little homages to like, you know, the edits were off, and you know, when Kurt Russell winks at the screen because he's about to kill these girls in the car, and it's really violent and crazy. But like, it, it, I think it does. It, you're totally correct in the fact that like when I try to rewatch it, I have a hard time rewatching it. You know what I mean? Because it that all that kind of shock of it of not knowing where they were going with it, and like you know, Kurt Russell's reveal at the end being this like little whoosh is getting his ass kicked like all of that is kind of you know it doesn't really work the second time no and that and that's like you probably watched it in an ideal state to really enjoy it the first yeah, time yeah but like that is totally like a one serving movie oh, like yeah 100 percent. yes breakdown is a great movie actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh an underrated movie it also it's also got what was his name uh jt walsh i think the bad guy yeah, he yeah. died yeah. Uh, the actor himself died a few years after, tragically, kind of young, who was sort of one of the great 90s character actor bad guys. Definitely. Uh, just, he was just kind of the sleazy bad guy in almost everything, it felt yeah. like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kurt Russell. You gotta love Kurt Russell movies. Oh, man, yeah. He's, you, you were saying after the hate, after he, you know, spoilers for a six-month-old movie, but you were yeah. saying after the hateful eight, after he dies, you just checked out? Yeah, and there's like still seven hours left after he <laughs> dies, and I was like, God damn it. <laughs> So I was yeah, I was kind of bummed. I, I, I could have done for more Kurt Russell in the movie. I quite like Kate Floyd, though. I think, thankfully, Samuel L. Jackson was enough, and uh, <laughs> Walton Goggins are sort of enough to carry a movie along for he's me. Such, but, he's such a beast. Yeah. Looking forward to his new show. And also joining us, we've got John Bivens. He's the new artist on Spread, starting with issue 14. He also has done Dark Engine for uh, Image Comics. John, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So... Unlike Dark Engine, there had been an established artist bef- on the, uh, you know, Kyle Strom on, on spread for the uh, first couple story arcs. Now, jumping onto this book, was there kind of a conscious decision to kind of, I don't want to say Im- imitates a little too strong, but kind of like do something in the stylistic vein of, of, of Kyle's uh, artwork? Or did you, were, did Justin kind of give you the go ahead to just make, give it your own? Uh, really, aside from trying to somewhat stay to uh, character designs, it's, Pretty much just, I get to do what I want uh, within the script. So I, I really don't have to follow Kyle's style, and Kyle has such a unique style, it'd be really weird for me to switch up like that. Um, but uh, no, I, I get to pretty much work in my own style, and since transferring over to Spread from Dark Engine, they both had lots of weird tentacly things going on, so it was a pretty easy you know, crossover there. Sure. I mean, and, and Justin had mentioned that you were that you were uh, you guys were friends before the project started. How did it all kind of come about that you uh, jumped on to spread? Um, well, they wanted to make sure that the book was coming out. Uh, the arcs came out in a, a fairly regular time period, and really, 
Kyle is also teaching and doing conventions and that kind of stuff, so they just need a fill-in artist, and I was available. Uh, I was actually just wrapping up my uh, thesis up here in Minneapolis, and I wanted to make sure that I was being visible again out on the comic scene. So uh, Justin was nice enough to say, hey, we have this. Do you want to help us out here? And I said, okay. Are you currently only kind of projected to be on for that for that third arc? Uh, we were talking about me being on for an arc after this. Sweet, nice. So, uh, you you had kind of mentioned the thesis. If you don't mind me asking, what are you what are you thesising? Uh, I actually finished that up this May. My my degree is actually a master of fine arts in comic art. Ooh, oh, I do. What are, what uh, what kind of influence was it? Just. Uh, was it in terms of like tracing the history of comic art, like talking like Alex Toth and Jack Kirby, or, or were you talking? Uh, about... Really, um, what it was is you you essentially got a lot of control of your own major. I, at MCAT, I went to Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and um, it was pretty much left up to you, through, along with the guidance of a mentor. And my mentor was uh, Tom Kaczynski, who's the publisher of Uncivilized Books, um, up here. And I made my thesis into a discussion of branding as a comic book artist or making yourself into a brand as a comic book artist um, and as an independent creator. So oh, That's cool. That's cool. Now, I mean, both, uh, you know, obviously Spread's always kind of had a lot of horror sensibilities from the start. I feel like Dark Engine had a lot of Lovecraft going on, a lot of those kind of Lovecraftian elements. Had you always been drawn to kind of the darker, more more kind of horrific elements? Uh, I definitely always enjoyed it. Um, with both these titles, I, I think uh, I, I, the writers sort of came up to me and said, you know, we we could do some projects together. I think you'd really be good on this, kind of. So I, I think that the writers kind of saw me as being able to do weird, monstery things. And I've definitely done a lot of that in the past, um, especially even coming into the business, uh, Justin and Jordan and my first collaboration together was weird monster horror things back in the DC uh, Zuda days with a uh, uh, web comic Rumors of War. So. Right. Um, now we we asked Justin this too because you know, as I'm sure you're well aware, he's a huge horror nut. Mm-hmm. Are you, in terms of like horror icons, are you team Michael Myers? Jason Voorhees, or Freddy Krueger? Between those three? I mean, you can uh, throw in Leatherface if you want. (laughs) (laughs) See, really, I'm a Pinhead fan, but... Oh, oh, nice. But uh, out of the the original three you gave me, I'll choose Freddy Krueger. Oh, that's the first... Like, every person we've had on this show that, like, you know, Tim Seeley's done a lot of horror work, obviously, like, Justin and all that... Everyone always says Michael Myers. You're the first person to not say Michael Myers. And that's really cool because Nightmare on Elm Street, well, the first Halloween's a masterpiece, first and foremost. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, is it because of the kind of the more visual inventiveness that, that, that Freddy Krueger kind of brings to his films? Uh, I would definitely say it's something like that. Uh, growing up, he he literally terrified me the most. It was like that scene in the first movie where he's walking down like the hallway with the extended arms with like the blades going up against the wall and that kind of thing. I always pictured, I had this weird stairwell when I was a kid in the house that I grew up in, and they had these tiny little window frames in them, and I always just pictured these long arms with knives just coming out and like grabbing me. And so it, it left like this, it, it, it's like that Jaws effect when, you know, you were scared of even going in like, family pools and kiddie pools because you're tiny and you think a shark's going to get you. <laughs> uh, for me, it, w- it was the same way with the whole Freddy Krueger thing. I-, I was just, there was no possible way to stop him, even like in your dreams or like he could become anything to destroy you. So in the most horrible ways, he can make your bed suck you up and spit you out. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Even Johnny Depp isn't safe from that one. No. Yeah. Now, what was it about Pinhead? Because Pinhead is kind of a... Uh, you know, I could never get in the most of the Hellraiser films because there is something... Like, I can stomach watching, watching like, Freddy Krueger 
do all sorts of like vile stuff in all the nightmare films. But there's something about the Hellraiser films that always kind of like, like kind of made me a little queasy. Mm. What is it about, about Pinhead that really stands out for you? Oh, it's definitely like, uh, it's the visuals and sort of like the mythologies that kind of built into it. Um, uh, especially when you get into, uh, Hellraiser 2 and you actually get to see hell in all this weird maze glory thing and then you have that on top of all the body horror and uh, it, visually it's astounding it has just some really great lines in it yeah I'm and uh, it's a dark gritty feel to that film it's just it, it, it feels dirty to like watching it I, I I too am a pretty big fan of the the Hellraiser and like I've read some of Clive Barker's books like he's amazing at like kind of like building this whole universe of uh, everything that's going on it's it, unfortunate that the further along the movie series go the kind of the further away from his stuff they got but uh but like you know uh like reading like uh, even even uh, book series that he has that aren't even like directly tied in with uh, the the Cenobites and and you know the Hellraiser specific storyline, it still shares a lot of the same mythology, and it's it's uh, it's ridiculous like how well uh, everything looks to be like kind of planned out from his perspective. So that's something that I always loved about the Hellraiser series myself. Oh yeah, that uh, I, I love like that Nightbreed or Illusion. Basically, yeah. all those movies of his because there was definitely this uh, strong feeling it and. Um, and even like his latest book uh, involving Pinhead, which was the Crimson Gospel, I had to mm-hmm. get that in, uh, immediately when it came out. And tying together uh, the Lord of Illusion character and uh, Pinhead, it was a fun read. Oh yeah, I'm looking forward to getting that. I haven't gotten my hands on it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Now to kind of take it back, what can we expect? I guess without giving the game away, what can we expect in this third story arc for for Spread? Um. Oh, well, there are, is going to be a lot of betrayal from different angles, um, a lot of bodies being ripped apart, uh, and some weird spread animal hybrids. So do you get to create, because we had kind of seen, and I, I was telling Justin this uh, earlier on the show, that the spread kind of looks like if the thing possessed the worms from Tremors. Um, can we expect some, so we can expect some kind of new incarnations of the spread moving forward into this arc? Uh, yeah, I think that's where I got to have especially a little bit of fun because, I mean, I could do, like, strange, weird, clawed, tentacle blobs all over, but it, it's a little bit more horrifying to me when you give it a form similar to something that you know. So, or, uh, something that, uh, something that exists in the real world, that's just twisted. Just like Freddy really, Krueger. Really horribly. <laughs> kind of like Freddy Krueger personifying the things that you kind of love or fear the most in your dreams. And then just like be it needle hands or I guess nothing. Wheelchairs. Wheelchairs too, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, it's funny because like, which one? Which one was it where he was like the giant worm thing? Was that the third one? Yeah, that's the third one where he uh, tries to eat Patricia Arquette. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's classic. Well, it's funny because like the the first Hellraiser, like out of all the other horror movies we've been talking about, I still am super uneasy watching that. And for me, the the funniest thing is the most uneasy scene for me is when the dad scrapes his hand against the nail that's sticking oh, yeah, out for sure. And like, just oh, yeah. tears his, like, Adam, I mean, he gets ripped apart spoilers in the end of that movie. <laughs> yeah. Jesus wept. Yeah. Jesus uh, wept. Technically and, that's yeah. the uncle getting ripped. Oh yeah, apart. that's true. Uh, yeah. yeah okay, if you yeah. paid attention that's to right, the story. Yeah. Well, it's, spoilers it's, again. It's, <laughs> it, it scarred me so much that I, I, I forgot everything that happened. Well, it scarred to him. him too. That but nail. yeah, they had, <laughs> but also I was thinking of, this is so stupid, but I, how have they not made like a, cereal based on the Cenobites, like called Cenobites, you know, with like Marshmallow Pinhead and the Chatterer. Because the Chatterer was always... I'm pretty sure I have seen that logo on T-Fury for a t-shirt. I I like to think if they made a cereal out of it, it would actually... The cereal would all look like the uh, cockroaches that that one bum is eating in the movie. That's right. Oh, man. And then then the prize at the bottom of the box is the box. The box. (laughs) It's the puzzle box. The the tagline is, what is your pleasure? Yeah, what is your pleasure? (laughs) Yeah, you actually have to solve the puzzle to get inside and get the cereal. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh man, that'd be perfect. And like you get the commercial. You need where, to trademark this episode. Like yeah. I said, like the <laughs> my my favorite Cinnabite was is, is, is he called the Chatterer? Is that his name? Yeah. He's just like the teeth. Yeah, and he would be the guy eating the cereal in the commercial because he can't talk <laughs> and he's just like chewing out on the spoon. It's perfect. And it would have cinnamon. Cinnamon. <laughs> of course, of course. Cinnamon Cinnabites. Cinnabites. Yeah, yeah Cinnabites. There you go. <laughs> Clive, Clive Barker's Cinnabites. <laughs> Coming to a supermarket near you. Available at Giant. Uh, yeah, that, that, that is destined to be like an uh, art poster mashup. Yeah, there has to be something somewhere. Um, so uh, artistically, you had kind of mentioned, um, you know, giant tentacle things were, were you a big manga guy growing up then <laughs> or, or do you what, what were some of your artistic influences uh artistic influences i was i was very much starting off i was a child of the 90s so all that stuff that was happening around then um that's when i really got into comics was like during the first image boom but then i quickly went from that to uh Luckily, I had a big family that was really into, like, all that kind of pop culture stuff. And so I was like, oh, and look, here's Mobius. And so I was getting things like heavy metal and, like, Mobius collections before I was uh, before I was probably old enough to have them. So, um, and that was yeah, kind of, yeah. And, so, and so heavy metal ended up being a big influence. I collected that for years. And now it's back with Grant Morrison at the helm, which is just It wild. is. Um, yeah, and I... It it seems really really interesting what they're doing. I've I've been fortunate enough. Uh, one of the new owners, Jeff Crowitz, is actually uh, semi local here. Some of the times in Minneapolis, so uh, I grabbed some drinks with him and talked about his plans for the future of it. And I'm looking forward to what they're going to be doing. So mm. it it should be some pretty cool stuff. So I mean, that's got to be wild though. That I mean, you grew up. I mean, I guess we all did uh, during the first image wave. You know, yeah. reading like Young Blood, Spawn, Spur- Spur- oh, yeah, Spawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <That's>, uh, <laughs> no, yeah. What? No one read Spawn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cyberforce. They mentioned Young Blood so much in the like, early Spawn stuff too. Yeah, because they uh, were supposed to be uh, in the same. Uh, I was definitely a Savage Dragon fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's got to be wild. You know, between this and and Dark Engine working for Image now. Oh yeah, yeah, Image. Uh, when I, when I first got Dark Engine accepted, it, it was definitely a big day for me. So, do you um, have? Yeah. And and we were fortunate enough that I mean it, it happened kind of like a whirlwind, and I I don't think I had time to really process it too much because we submitted on a Friday and we heard back on Monday that uh, that they were going to do it, and so it was kind of like oh wow that happened quickly, and then it, it took me like. A couple of weeks to be like, oh shit, I'm looking for image. <laughs> so. That's kind of man. Yeah, that, I feel like that's kind of like a spoiled experience. I don't hear that happening a lot. Where they give, they just let you know after a weekend. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> man. yeah I, I was very spoiled by that. I, I was told by a lot of people that I shouldn't tell that story, but I keep telling it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it takes me like a week to hear back on like a column. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> and then that's usually just a round of like revision notes like oh but um so uh, do you have anything anything cooking outside of spread any like maybe short story or anthology work coming up um i'm working on kind of a finished version of what my thesis was for school which what i published was a uh, uh basically an 80 page proof of concept and i'm going to pretty much double that uh for a graphic novel based off of Three characters that I I kind of developed uh, years ago, and then um, along with also I have just a ton of pitches out right now because I, I quickly learned that the key to uh, doing comics is just constantly hustling and juggling tons and tons of things and hoping something works. So yeah, uh, basically yeah, pitch so everything and making, see what sticks. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's it's constantly making pitches and working with. A uh, bunch of different writers I respect to see if uh, we can come up with something that people like and want to want to publish. So that's cool, man. So this is something we ask everybody on the show. What are you currently geeking out over? What am I currently geeking out over? Um, you know what? I know that it's not uh, accurate to the comic book, but I actually really, really enjoyed the Lucifer show. So that. Uh, that's on TV, and I'm waiting for the new season to start up in the fall. So, 
It, it was kind of that, yeah. It was I I had only seen like the first couple episodes, but it was very. I guess it's in terms of like network television. I feel like if it was on cable, you could do a lot more with the character just be based on lack of content restrictions. But I guess like in terms of like network TV, that was probably as good as it could get. Yeah, and I think that the uh, guy they have acting it out, yeah, he's not blonde, but I think he's playing a. He's got the cockiness down so much. I think he's playing a really good Lucifer. Um, kind of has that swagger. Oh yeah, definitely has swagger, and where they left off in this last season. I mean, this last season was very much procedural with a little bit of like the weird supernatural stuff behind it, but it feels like they're setting up for a much bigger, like supernatural season next, next, uh, in the fall. So had you been a big fan of Mike Carey's Lucifer series? Uh, honestly, I didn't read much of the actual Lucifer series. I mean, which I is probably why I can enjoy the show more that separation because i'm not trying to relate it to that but well then i'm really really good at like separating myself and saying when i'm watching this in a different media this is not the same thing so and a lot is going to be lost and things are going to have to be um changes are going to have to be made so um i'm really good at divorcing the original product from from the adaption so yeah i kind of feel the same way about preacher yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing more of Preacher because I don't have cable or any of that kind of stuff. So I'm waiting. I, I saw a couple episodes while I was uh, on vacation recently, and um, and now I enjoy them. So I have to wait for it to actually come to streaming now, and that's going to be painful. So got to get on that iTunes, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, well, I'm a, I'm a voodoo yeah. guy myself when it That's comes right. to streaming services, but yeah, um, but yeah, and, and anything else that you're currently kind of just just vibing on, be it you know movies or music or I mean anything in the comic world. Mm-hmm. Um, something that I I constantly vibe on whenever I'm actually drawing comics, I listen to audiobooks and that kind of stuff, and I listen to a lot of different stuff, but I always seem to go back to listening to uh, Jim Butcher's The Dresden File books. Uh, and in audiobooks, they're read by James Marsters, who's the guy who played Spike on Buffy. And so it, it, it's, it's really, uh, it, it's really, it's hard for me to not hear uh, Harry Dresden's voice as uh, as Spike now from <laughs> Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But uh, I always enjoy that. I always go back to it because I, I've now listened to them so many times I don't have to pay attention while I'm drawing. So it's just like background noise to me. But it's like the most, it puts you in that zone. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's like listening to uh, jazz or anything else like that. I mean, I, I'm not even hearing words at this point. It, it's literally just like the, the uh, level of the voice. So, uh, Whenever I'm working, I always do uh, the extended editions of Lord of the Rings because... Ah. There's so much like dialogue, and so I'm like, you know, writing something or whatever. Or I'm I'm putting together interviews or what have you. And then when I start to get bored of that, there's an action scene, and it's like mm-hmm. perfect. And then like you know that ten fifteen minute action sequence ends. And I'm like, all right, cool, back to work. And it's like awesome, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. But oh, uh, yeah. but yeah. So uh, is there anything else you can share uh, share, John, before we uh, we sign out? Oh. Uh- no, I think that that's about it. Um, I, I hope this matches up good with uh, Justin's interview. So, uh, and I really appreciate any of the support that, uh, well, the support that you're giving us by uh, spreading the word for us. So, no pun intended. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, there was no pun intended, but until I, I actually like felt that word coming out of my mouth, I was like, oh god, <laughs> <laughs> spread the word. Yeah. Uh, and again, the uh, 14th issue of uh, of Spread is in comic book shops and on Comixology on uh, Wednesday, July 6th. Uh, you can get the first two volumes on Comixology and comic book shops. It's just a lot of fun. Again, if you like if you like the thing, if you like Tremors, and if you like, interestingly enough, Lone Wolf and Cub, mm-hmm. it's kind of this like jam session of all three things. John, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, it's always nice to have those guys Absolutely, on. Absolutely, yeah. I will say you should probably keep your ears open for Justin Jordan because I don't think we're done with him. 
You might hear him next week. You'll hear him next week. I'm not even going to pretend. You're, he's part that you might have noticed that interview kind of ended a little abruptly on his end. It's because we're going to we have him back on for more to talk about another book he's doing uh, next week with his artist. It's 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 for fucking Luther Strode. Trad oh, Moore yeah. joins him. Yeah, oh, man. Keep an eye out for that one next week. Um, no, but yeah, you know, I talked to Justin very briefly. He's always been, and we say as much in the interview. He's been at every single Awesome Con. Yeah, since there's been an Awesome Con. Sure. Yeah. Even before it, like. Even back when it was just in the side rooms. That's right. In, in yeah. uh, the convention center. Now now even the registration room is like twice the size of the first year's entire con. Yeah, so... And it's only on year, what, four now? It is. It's yeah. wild how you know much that's exploded over the years. So yeah, thanks, Justin, for supporting the DC comic sure, book scene. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, it was kind of cool like laying the groundwork for this interview a couple weeks in advance. Because uh, I think that was we recorded the interview like the week after Awesome Con or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was so, pretty yeah. fresh. Pretty still pretty fresh. So. Yeah, so it was like yeah, it was. I cool. think I had just added him on Skype when I went up and I was like, oh hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was cool like laying that groundwork down. Um, but yeah, so you guys do anything interesting? Anything cool on the fourth or third or whatever? Because I did all my festivities on the third. Well, I um, <laughs> I work at Mount Vernon as we've discussed probably before. I feel like every time we've done it, we've done it off mics. So I don't know. I'm sure we said it before. No, yeah, we, we've talked about it. Okay, whatever. Um, just to lay some background information. And um, so I had Saturday off. My mom's birthday was this past Thursday, the anniversary of Love Gun. And um, <laughs> what a fitting anniversary yeah, for her birthday. Exactly. Um, I'm just going to say it's her favorite Kiss album. <laughs> it probably just, is. I mean, why wouldn't it be? Why would, I mean, it's <laughs> damn good. But um, so what she really wanted for her birthday was to get tickets for the first year they're doing um, fire, fireworks at Mount Vernon on July 2nd. And normally on an after-hour event like that, like a big after-hour event, they're looking at maybe a little north of 1,000 people. Um, this year, this first time thing they were doing, fireworks, you know, Mount Vernon, you know, with General Washington, the whole, just all of it being this wonderful thing wrapped together, it was 2,600 people. And so I was, you know, lucky enough to grab some tickets uh, took my sister and my mom. We went and, you know, it was nice because she had gone to Mount Vernon earlier this year and wasn't able to go to the mansion, which is busy. And she was like, yeah, I'll just, you know, come back later. My son works here. And uh, so we were able to take her to the mansion. That was nice. Um, only the second time I've actually been through it since I started working there. You know, I don't I don't hang out in the mansion um, and got to see, you know, just some fun stuff, some activities they were doing around. Um, they had um, a band there playing like music like period appropriate music and then they play the star trek theme <laughs> i swear to god period appropriate yeah it was cool i mean it was cool hearing i was like i know i've heard this like a lot recently <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 brought back like uh, sense memories of like star wars or star trek six yeah oh. like, ah! the fuck out of here um <laughs> Why that one? yeah jesus <laughs> Um, but uh and then it was really cool of course they they did the fireworks around like 9 30 and seeing those kind of fly over and and set the stage over um the mansion was really cool. Something, you know, it's, I, I kind of got to reflect a little bit like, hey, man, I've got to re- do some really cool stuff ever since I started working here. And, and, um, and you know, just reflect on the whole thing. And it was really nice and wonderful and cool. And so that was kind of how I, at least my mom, sister, and I really celebrated the fourth on, on the second because um, I was working on the, you know, on the fourth. So um, you also saw The Legend of Tarzan. The Legend of Tarzan. I did. I did do it. Um, I, I would, will say before you get into it, uh, I, as has been documented on this show, work at a movie theater. Yeah. I have been hearing nothing but flack for this movie. Yeah, yeah, it's getting like pretty hardcore flack. Um, and I know you have a contrarian point of view. Yeah, well, my thing is like, a lot Just of people... because it's getting flack doesn't mean that ID4 Part 2 won your little bet, Josh. Yeah. I see your smirk. Um, I'm, I'm actually about to check the box office so we can have an official... Yeah. Carry on. No, no. Um, you know, and, and again, I knew you know, the movie was getting hit really hard. Um, and I guess I kind of knew that was going to happen. And I've been listening to the Tarzan books on audiobook as I've been driving to work. Just a fun way to kill some time and familiarize myself with the character a little better. And as I was listening to the books, I was like, does... Is Alexander Skarsgård a good choice? And then, you know, seeing the movie, I think he... I think, you know, he's... Basically, the best way I could put it is... I. It was a lot like how I felt after I watched John Carter. Like, I enjoyed the hell out of it. Like, it was a really fun movie. Um, but it's got its problems, you know. Tarzan's got, you know, some really goofy stuff. The CG is, for me, the weakest part of the whole movie. Not a huge fan of the CG. There's some really just not-so-good-looking things. But I enjoyed They had some great moments with the source material. Um, there's some great callbacks to the novels. 
um, and some kind of cool badass moments. It was a, it was a little bit more brutal than I thought it was going to be in terms of Tarzan's fighting style. Like he just kicks the shit out of like a train a train car full of people. Clearly kills a couple of them. Um, but I dug it. I mean, like again, you know, of course he does the yell twice. Um, they did it in a very tasteful way as well. And uh, I thought it was just just a fun movie. I just enjoyed it, and um, uh, yeah, I just I just enjoyed the movie. You know, thought it was cool. There's deliberating going on. What's what what's what's where are we looking number wise? Uh, uh, so I'm I'm looking at uh, the uh, box office mojo. Yeah, boxofficemojo.com, and I'm seeing that uh, on its opening weekend, the results that I have uh, are forty one million dollars for Independence Day, uh-huh. and then for Legend of Tarzan, uh, thirty eight point five. How? And then I've got on mine. Yeah. It includes the IMAX stuff, which boosts it to forty five. Uh-huh. So I don't know how you got. This is between. I have no stake for, in this. for forty five for Independence Day or Tarzan. For Tarzan, okay. Uh, in theory, then, if if your numbers are that different, they might be different for Independence Day as well. Do you, I would do you say have the, the best is to look at um, w- Wikipedia. Put bo- I think both together. My thing is, how the fuck did it get that? Is it even that close? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like when I made that bet, I was like. But well, Tarzan is going to get in, obliterated in in your in Tarzan's defense and your defense, yeah. I guess. Uh, Independence Day Resurgence has also been getting that much flack, like yeah. just like how you're like more or less the one voice of someone like being like <laughs> yeah. in Tarzan's I, and corner. I, and I understand I, that people are giving a flack. I get it. I was the one voice in my circle of friends yeah. giving Independence Day like it was a Roland Emmerich movie. Yeah. What do you yeah. expect? It's uh, I'm I'm coming up 41 million just period on on mine. Okay, for for Independence Day for Resurgence. Yeah. Ooh, so but now you got an IMAX version I, too. Let me let me. I'm just reading. Let so, me check. Right. So, so I, I saw so the IMAX numbers. Impartial, on Wikipedia. Yeah. impartial rulings. Yeah, uh, I, I'm. I pay for my burger either way, so I have no. <laughs> yeah, so so, yeah, no, so so I, my I'm not... my re, my results say Independence Day won. Sam's results say that Tarzan won. Yeah. Somebody wanted to demand a recount. <laughs> I'll just say, you know, I'll just have to see it. Uh, demand. <laughs> did you, uh, had, uh, while while everyone's checking their phones, Josh? Yeah. Did you see Independence Day yet? No. <laughs> I don't want to see it by myself. Sorry, I want to sorry, see it with friends. Sorry, sorry. The, the way that the way that you like, said no. Why the fuck no. would I see that? You're, movie? you're like, no. I was rooting for this to win, but I'm not going to pay for it. No, I'm I'll, not going to. I know, I know. I know. I know you would pay for it, but like, the, just the way that you said it, yeah. just like to me, was just like, what? Why would I go see that piece of shit? <laughs> okay, so uh, let me just read some Wikipedia for. I guess Wikipedia, but let me read what it says for. Um, Independence Day. I like how we didn't Two. do this ahead of time or off mic or anything. <laughs> it, 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 it makes it fresh. It it's makes real. it real. Yeah. Uh, it it's opened across 4,068 theaters, which includes 3,242 3D locations, 386. Blah, blah, blah. It made 4 million in Thursday night previews for 3,200. Uh, okay. Opening day, it made 16.8 million. What the fuck? Okay. It's opening weekend. The film grossed 41 million, less than 50.2 million of its original. Finishing behind the animated uh, Finding Dory, IMAX made up 5 million of the film's opening numbers. So, forty-one million. Five of that million is from IMAX, according to this. So it would have been thirty-six. Also, also, so I did see, see on uh, on your thing uh, something about four-day opening weekend, oh, and right. mine. Counts, my, yeah, that's yeah, true. My, fourth, because we, yeah. we, we can't we can't do that. Then. Mine, gotta, mine only can counts it though because mine, it's still the fourth. <laughs> well, but but <laughs> yeah, the well, but my yeah, mine tallies. The opening weekend. Let okay. me see what it Just says. Just three for, days for Tarzan here. Tarzan, Tarzan, Tarzan. Listen to Tarzan. But here. wouldn't that be like Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Yeah, I think I think Thursday night is included uh, in Friday's totals. Okay. For for any of you guys who don't know what the fuck we're doing, like <laughs> a couple months ago, Josh and Jake made a, made a bet. A gentleman's. A gentleman's wager. wager. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would gross more domestically its opening weekend? So yeah, Josh here's was team Independence Day Resurgence. Jake was team Legend of Tarzan. And I'm still amazed that it's even this fucking close. So here's what it says about Tarzan. 
In its opening weekend, buoyed by positive word of mouth, the film grossed a better than expected thirty eight point five million, of which IMAX contributed three point nine million. So if that's the case, then it's just Independence Day won because okay, yeah. and it said and forty five point six million over its four day Independence Day. So it got like another like seven today. Yeah. So you can't we can't okay, that do, might, yeah, we can't include because right. it's a gentleman's it's a gentleman's wage. Yes. Yeah. If it was a yeah. gentleman's, then fuck yeah, you. Yeah. Because because yeah. That, that would because that wouldn't be fair to Independence yeah. Day because Independence Day didn't have a yeah, fourth, did, you know, it didn't have a weekend. July fourth four day weekend. Yeah. Um, so yeah, saved your ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. from buying a burger That's yeah. right. at Red Robin. That's right. Um, so Red Robin next week, gentlemen. Let's do it, I and guess. let's and yeah. let's let's pick a day where we go see Independence Day then, because you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it yet either. I'm seeing it. Yet. And then um, we'll pick a day to what see if, Tarzan. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll see it again. Yeah, sure, yeah. why not? Um, again, like I like I said, I, I, I it's one of those guys that like I I know like. I'm sure if we all Double saw it, Tuesday? Uh, <laughs> you know, when we see it all together, like we're, most of you guys are probably like, what the fuck? But like, I don't know. I, I, I am a softy for like, like the moment when he does the Tarzan yell, like was cool. The moment where he mimics animal sounds. Cause that's in the book and they do it in a cool way is cool. The moment where he like fucking goes full Tarzan and like beats the shit out of some guys. And, and the is full like, frontal nudity. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a really, I know Josh, you, there's a really nice moment that you will appreciate where there is like a, uh, uh, a Jaguar, like about to fuck up like a baby, Eight, like a baby gorilla and it's like really sad and like margot robbie as jane who i liked a lot is doing this um the the tribes people are singing the legend of tarzan when they go to visit and she's explaining to samuel L. jackson what they're saying and that's from the trailer she's like no man has started with less oh she, she says it to christoph waltz but she's like you know uh you know he's people thought he was a ghost and blah 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 it's like the phantom and he swings in and saves the day with this like little ape and stuff and but you get to see like young Tarzan where he's like dreads and covered in like mud and shit you know and looks all crappy you get to see Jane meet Tarzan for the first time so I, I feel like they did a good job but just unfortunately the CG for me is is easily for me the worst part of the movie some really cheesy lines some really weird things in it as well but uh, again it's it's kind of like a lesser John Carter in terms of like enjoyment that I got out of it I just I had a good time watching it um and thought it was fun so that's my review of The Legend of Tarzan. I liked it better than X-Men and fucking Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that's for sure. Mm. <laughs> Which I never thought, like, years from now, they'd be like, you like X-Men or Tarzan more? And I'd be like, oh, tar- X-Men. And then I saw it, and I'm like, fuck you, <laughs> X-Men movie. Yeah. I'll take uh, Skarsgård. Alexander Skarsgård. You don't see his butt, though. That's stupid. There's, like, a, clearly a shot where you could see his butt, and they don't do it. They, they were like, They're waiting for the ultimate edition. Yeah. Well, that would have been right there the deciding factor on. Who you know what's funny is if like it, you know, Tarzan, Tarzan won because of like twenty bucks, and it's because I saw it on a Friday and paid fucking full <laughs> price for that shit. <laughs> it's the yes. narrowest, yeah, the narrowest, the narrowest. Margin. I, I am, I am shocked that it even made thirty-eight million dollars because, like, again, so much of opening weekends for movies that people are unsure of is based on like Rotten Tomatoes. And both of these movies are like in the early thirty percent, which is actually better. For Tarzan started off at like a nineteen; it's like at like thirty five or something now, thirty six. But whatever, you know, you can you can use Tar- uh, Tarzan, you can use Rotten Tomatoes as a barometer for fun. I don't. Um, yeah, it's but you know, like I said, if if I went by that, I would I wouldn't have seen this movie. So I always champion against Rotten Tomatoes for that fact because it can kill the potential for anyone that's just curious. Sure. Period. Yeah. I mean, like you know, but again, at the end of the day, it's the person's fault for not going to see it. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten yeah. Tomatoes again is a combination of people's reviews. Yeah. You know? Aggregates. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, it, and it, it's kind of taken on a life of its own. But you know, I, I like to the to, point where you see them on like Blu-ray cases. Yeah, I, I don't like, like this that. Is I don't certified fresh. I don't like that certified fresh thing. That, I remember working. I was working at a blockbuster store and I saw that for the first time, and I was like, "That, that you know, the fuck out of here." The fuck out of here. But um, it is cool though. I'm a total hypocrite. It is cool though when like Mad Max came out in like '97, because then you know yeah. people are gonna go see that movie. Oh yeah, um, it, it can work the other way. Sure, it can. But again, I, the I, door I, swings both ways. I, I yeah. like to think of it as uh, that. I kind of I use it in like as a, a, as a healthy. <laughs> A healthy mana, mm. healthy way. So anyway, Josh, I'll I'll yeah, I'll, you buy your, I'll buy your I'll buy your burger. But your yeah, burger. you guys do anything this past week? Um, I read, and by that I mean listened to, uh, because I you know much I, like I, much I like Jake, thing, yeah. I I audio book uh, a lot of times on the the drive to work. Uh, Armada, the second book by Ernest Klein, uh, the the gentleman who wrote Ready Player One, movie ah. coming out soon. It started production, right? Did yes, they? it started yeah. production. All I know is that it's being directed by uh, Steven Spielberg, so I'm like, 
Could be good. BFG is like gonna be in it. BFG. BFG. The BFG <laughs> is doing terribly. I know, I know <laughs> man. And it and like not surprised. Uh, one of the I'm kids one of the kids that I work with came out of BFG and was like, That's the worst movie I've seen all year. Spielberg, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah, right. Make more I mean, Lincoln, less BFG. How yeah. old is that make, book? Make more Lincoln, make less stinking. Yeah. Oh! Oh! Oh, but it's about 50 years old. Yeah. yeah. There's been multiple movies of it, or Has at there? least another one. It's by Raoul Dahl, right? Yeah, so it's like 50s, yeah. 60s. I kind of want to see Pete's the Dragon. Oldest. I can't remember because I, of BFGs. I read the book. Or Dragons. Probably maybe did. like when I was in middle school, maybe. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's I'm certainly like possible. Yeah. I'm willing to bet you read The Great Gatsby, and that was published in you know like the. And I have actually never been required to read The Great Gatsby, oh. and you never chose to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why would you? That yeah. book is terrible. I haven't even seen the films. <laughs> Neither have I. The Robert Redford one's cool. I yeah. do enjoy the Robert. I have Redford. heard um, that one. Leo one is I've, not. I've terrible. seen the play because my I, I was on tech crew when my school put it on. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I sort of read the book in high school English English class. Anyway, so Armada, yes, um, <laughs> is basically uh, Armada. Ernest Klein was like, hey, you know, the last Starfighter and uh, Ender's Game were fun books or movies, you know, respectively. Uh, but you know what they were missing? Uh, um, at least two references to eighties pop culture, mostly video games, every page, uh, and that's what I do so well. Uh, people loved it in Ready Player One, and that's true. I did love it in Ready Player One, but I did not love it in Armada. Mm. Book was all right. It was it was enjoyable. Um, but yeah, there was there was just so many times where I was just like, oh my god, stop forcing references to Star Wars and uh, Galaga or not Galaga because I, I I don't know. I don't know video games as well as I know everything else. But Galaga I know it is an eighties video game. That's true. That's why that's why I pulled it out of my ass. But I'm pretty sure he never actually references Galaga in the book. But uh, but like I was but I was like I don't know the reference, but I can tell that it's supposed to be a reference because the, the, even Will Wheaton is the guy that's reading it. Even he kind of like pauses and it almost sounds like he like pauses and groans half the time. <laughs> Uh, uh, when he's like making like another like the uh, nerdy reference to something. Well, mm. that also is Will Wheaton. I wonder if yeah. that's like a like an editor thing. Like, you know what people liked about Ready Player One? You need to make more references. No, mm. that well, I don't know. I I totally believe that Ernest Klein in real life is that kind of person because I've uh, he's in the Back to the Future documentary that I uh, that I watched a little while ago because he owns a screen accurate. DeLorean yep. and he was in the uh, documentary about uh, uncovering or unearthing the E.T. Um, Atari game. Oh yeah I watched that. Yeah he's, he's the guy that's in the DeLorean. Oh that's, that's right. He yeah, okay, George R.R. Right. Martin's DeLorean in that doesn't he? I have no I, 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 I just remember he's I in thought one. he was driving his own hmm. because I know he has one. Okay. Maybe he has um, one now I don't know. I mean he yeah. probably has the money for it. So. Yeah especially after that Ready Player One money. Um yeah. mm-hmm. But like it, it, it was good. There was, like I said, there's a lot of times where I'm just like, oh my god, just keep going with the story. And and, and like it's it's very clear that he knows exactly how the video game that is the simulation. You know, if you know Last Starfighter or know Ender's Game, you know the basic setup of what's going on. Kids playing a video game that is actually real life conflict in the stars so this was his follow-up to ready player one and not it's, like sequel but yeah like in no, terms but of yeah like, this, this is his book second that book. he followed with okay yeah. uh this is his sophomore novel. how how re- i'm not as familiar with ready player one as you guys are how f- long ago was that book did it come out do you guys remember no 2010 okay it's not that old okay Ish. okay so no, i know not i know that, long ago, I know that it had been out for a little while when i read it and i read it in 2012 2013 okay uh, but funny. it had been out for at yeah, least like a year, ten, nine, something around there. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it's 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 really good, especially if you know a thing or two about '80s pop culture in general, because it's littered with it, and it actually serves a purpose in that in that book. In Armada, it's l- literally just him jerking himself off, like ah, I know '80s references, mm. you know. Uh, he probably thought, you know, that first book sold so well yeah. with all of it he probably thought well, why change and, gears and, no, and, and, Again, and that's and why I thought it was an editor thing yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it could be you know partially an editor thing and he's just like well I, I do know a lot of things about 80s video games let's make a book about 80s video games coming to life but it's better than pixels uh, 
<laughs> Although I can't That's say really that because nice. I still haven't seen Pixels. I, I have. It's not that hard to do. Yeah, but you haven't read Armada. True. Yeah, but you can probably safely. Guess. I mean, I could just <laughs> resubscribe to Loot Crate, and eventually, it probably would just be in one of its yeah. boxes, like Ready Player One was. Yeah. I listened to it on Audible, which I'm now on Audible. Doc. Yeah, um, I have all. I, I please keep... sponsor us. <laughs> right? I, keep I, would, doing... I would I would love for Audible to sponsor us. Well, At first I was like, boo, I'm not going to pay for a service and then buy books through them. Yeah. But then I found out that every month you get a credit, oh, yeah. which is good for any book Dude, on Audible. I've been no writing matter... that for months. Yeah. Yeah. I have not paid. Here, here's some, I mean, granted, I've been paid been for char- Audible. I've been paid, paid for Audible, but I have not. Since I've had Audible, I've never paid for a book. Because like I just let the credits build up. Yeah. Um. Like say because like we should. I feel like we should have like an audible corner. Like talk about whatever. Because like I. What book are you reading? Well, this I'm month? doing uh, <laughs> uh, the coming of Conan the Sumer- Sumer- Sum- Sumerian. 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 The Sumerian? great Sumerian. Yeah. The the the. Um. I always get the that good fucking Sumerian? yeah. I always get that, the the, the Sumerian. Sumerian. Sumer- Sumerian. Yeah. Sumerian. Sumerian. It's fucking Sumerian. <laughs> God damn it. Um, Sumeria. Yeah. Conan the Bar of fucking Barian. <laughs> and um, I'm reading what they're doing is they they put for the longest time Robert E. Howard stuff was like fucked with, and so they're putting like the original stories of Conan done not in chronological order, but how when he like how he wrote them because his thing was like. Don't worry about writing, reading the first Conan story, like when he's like a baby or a boy or whatever. Worry about just like how I read them. Because his thing was, he, the story as I always heard is that he went a little cuckoo, you know. Um, For Cocoa Puffs? Yeah. And that he would envision like Conan standing behind him and being like telling him the story and being like, read this or I'm going to cut your fucking head off with his axe. <laughs> kind of shit. Um, I don't know how true that is, but I remember seeing it in a documentary um, about the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. And... So um, that's what I'm doing right now, and then I, the next on deck is Total Recall, the Arnold Schwarzenegger autobiography. Ooh, I'm looking forward to that. But um, yeah, I mean, I have a bunch of books. Just like I just downloaded when I had the credits because Total Recall is based on a book. Yeah. It's oh, the short yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We but will I mean, remember it but, but, wholesale but, but, for you. Yeah, but reading like, the okay, actual Dick. like mm. you know yeah, autobiography, it's the perfect name for Arnold's. Yeah. Oh, it is. And yeah. I heard it's like a legitimately great kind of yeah. like his his life story like is is pretty fucking unreal. When you really stop thinking yeah. about it, like not just the, not becoming an actor or even a bodybuilder, just like how he kind of well, like, he didn't go get to go to his father's funeral. Yeah, <laughs> are you pumping Iron fans out there for the, the fakeness? But um, of that story, um, but yeah, that's the, that's those are the those are the audible things I'm using right now. I have 2001: A Space Odyssey on deck, the yes. Arthur C. Clarke book that was inspired by the movie. I have a first printing of that. Ooh, mm. Josh, what did you do this week? I attended a barbecue. And mainline the new Netflix Voltron series. Uh, Is it good? Beautiful reboot. Uh, I laughed. I cried. I thought it ended way too short for a first season because it kind of felt like we aren't sure if this is going to be a massive hit, so we're just going to give you 11 episodes, including the hour-long pilot. Mm. Um. I thought the pilot was very well paced for being an hour long, and then as the regular episodes rolled in, I thought these are just way too short. Like yeah. the pilot was just the right amount of length of time to, for the story told, and I thought every episode should just be an hour long. Well, that kind of makes sense. Uh, the uh, you know, I mean, the, there is really no way to tell if something's really going to sink or swim, especially a reboot of some you know something that's like as loved as Voltron is uh, by you know nostalgic kids and whatnot. Uh, so, uh, like I can understand them being like, okay, let's do 10 episodes and then you got 11, which is, is cool. That's a, yeah. a weird number for a season, but, uh, you know, usually it's like 10 or 13. Right. Uh, uh, and then like, depending on how, you know, the reaction is, which apparently Netflix has a very weird algorithm for, for reaction. It's not based on views, but it's based on all kinds of other things very complicated algorithms from my understanding it could just be like flip the coin oh, yeah. kids like orange is the new black uh <laughs> and it works out uh but uh but yeah like based on whether people like it uh who knows maybe in like six months we'll have you know like a 30 episode second season and they'll all be hour longs and you'll be very excited i mean that would be nice like i was watching I chances had... are there's still gonna be half hour episodes but you know yeah i mean could. i had a brief remembrance of the original and then you know while i was watching the reboot i just decided to go on wikipedia to see you know who voiced some of the characters because some of them sounded familiar some of them didn't and um i real i came across that voltron has had like four different versions 
Like, oh, like different, like different series. incarnations? Yeah. Well, it's had like, there was the Voltron and then there were like three other series that followed it, I guess, like yeah. continuing the story in different directions. Okay. And then this reboot happened. So I had never watched any of the other ones. And I thought, you know, from what I remember, this seemed to, you know, pay homage to it, but took it in a different direction that works really well for it. And, um, I thought with how, you know, the last episode ends, you know, they just leave a lot of questions you want to get answered. Well, that's that's also another tactic to get people interested in a second season. You know, like leave them wanting more. Yeah. You know, that's why a lot of movies, like a lot of people complain like, oh, all these movies are being left open for a sequel. It's like, well, that's what you're supposed to fucking do. You know, you're supposed to make people want there to be more. You're not supposed to just be like, all right, that's all you need. And yeah. everyone's like, good. And also, that was enough. That was sufficient. And also, make enough money so you get to answer those questions. Yes. Uh, but yeah, um, I remember. I don't, I don't actually remember ever watching Voltron, but I remember having the Voltron toy, and I remember liking Voltron. But like, I've and, I, and I've never gone back to watch them to see if like anything like you know sparks anything in my brain. Like, uh, but like, I, I when I heard that these were coming out, I was like, meh. I might check those out. And I just, I'm in the midst of a Scrubs rewatch right now. Mm. Yeah, I'm almost done with season three. Uh, no, I finished season three today. Uh, so I'm That's about. the wedding, right? Yes. One of my favorite moments of all time is when all the band members get sick from eating the shrimp or whatever. <laughs> and uh, what's his face? Um, the worthless peons. Yeah, yeah. What's Ted. The, the Ted, thank you. I was like, I just fucking rewatched this for like the fifth time. Ted. And they're going to go up there and they're like, you know, why we we don't usually play with instruments. We're a little rusty. Uh, let's see what we can do. One, two, three, four. Ooh, I need you. And they go like right into it perfectly, and it's just yeah. fucking great. Is that is? Uh, I, I mean, Turk uh, Turkleton, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I think my <laughs> name is Turk Turkleton. <laughs> and Mrs. Turkleton. Turk, Tur- yeah, Turkleton. <laughs> uh, the Turkletons. <laughs> uh, uh, I know. I know you didn't watch it today, like I did. Yeah. But um, from your memory, is that like the studio version of? Uh, eight days a week, or is it actually like? No, I mean, well, one, they wouldn't be able to afford the studio version, but like two, um, I mean, it's Scrubs. They yeah. <laughs> season three of Scrubs. I mean, they, you know, they I love season gone, three. They haven't like, even gone widescreen yet. That's right. I um, I uh, I mean, they, Ted is definitely they're always definitely singing like Ted because like you know they, they he's got a good voice like he sings they See, sing. Uh, well, you're you and Sam are the 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 Beatles aficionado. No, but it, that it, is the Beatles, right? Yes. Okay, um, I, I had a Ray Park moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, that's what I'm going to refer to. Well, I'm, I mean, yeah. Um, Listen to episode 100B. To... 100B. <laughs> 100B. <laughs> but yes, I, I I, I, about that, I'm right? assuming they played their instruments too. I, I don't know if that's the case, but you know, definitely Ted's voice. I mean, I know they're, they're, act, uh, they're an actual a cappella band. Yeah. So. The Worthless Peons. Yeah. Point flip. <laughs> uh, cool. What about you, Sam? Oh, well, uh, you know, I went to a friend's place out in D.C. on uh, Sunday, I guess, and drank a lot <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. Um, Didn't you say when we when we met up uh, earlier at Starbucks that you still think you're a little hungover still? And that hasn't ob- that situation <laughs> is still in play. Um, yeah, the uh, passed out on a couch and went, God, what is this fucking college again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, at yeah. least you didn't wake up in a pool of your own vomit. I or didn't did re- you? I didn't really do that a lot in college. I always vomited and then passed out, like in a proper receptacle. No, there was one time in college. Okay, yeah, that did happen. But, but uh, just that was early college. I learned. Um, no, yeah, I I got a kind of I made a, a Korean style burger. Like I basically took like what would be like I made basically kalbi sauce and put it on burgers. So you had nice Korean burgers. The trick, kids, is to uh, make uh, teriyaki sauce, and Koreans love things sweeter. That's probably why I have my sweet tooth. No, it's just a generalization. That's why you're so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's rotten. I'm rotten, <laughs> goddammit. No, the, uh, the what you do is you add a quarter cup of honey and two teaspoons of sugar if you're just making, like, a cup of the sauce. And, uh, yeah, it comes out. You get a nice kind of galbi style. You know, I think that's uh, just, like, uh, that... F- food right there is a perfect analogy for you because you got your american hamburger mm-hmm. and you got your korean kalbi sauce is that kalbi yeah kalbi? The, the, like the short ribs they're they're yeah. kalbi yeah gotcha um yeah uh, somebody w- at the party was like 
was like opposites don't attract you know everybody likes to stick within like the same like ethnicities and same like religions and stuff and i was like well i'm kind of like my mere existence is a direct counterpoint to your argument (laughs) (laughs) hi yeah and you're wrong (laughs) person's head just exploded yeah. By your pure existence, yeah. right? Yeah, by the sheer fact that I <laughs> exist. The, and, and and the fact that you have a younger sibling, yeah. so that it wasn't just some like freak accident that you exist. Yeah. And then the rest the, the, of their body the clearly, exploded. Clearly, your parents intended on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I was not a... Or at I, least didn't learn I from was their not, mistakes. Well, I was not, <laughs> yeah, I was not <laughs> conceived out of wedlock. And my, of course, like, you know, my sister obviously shows that I was not a one-and-done scenario yeah. there. Um, but uh, you no. weren't a child of disgust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, this was a mistake. <laughs> I will I say never I was, do that again. Yeah, I will say I was unplanned. But anyway, that that now we're just going down Main Street. But the uh, <laughs> um, no, it was a lot of. It's always a lot of fun. I always like to cook. Um, I, I feel like I don't do it a lot in my personal life because I don't really give a shit what I eat. But when I'm like preparing stuff for other people, yeah, it's always a lot of fun. So. I'm kind of the same way. Yeah. I didn't go to any concerts this, since the last episode. I didn't see any movies. I haven't seen any movies since the second Ninja Turtles, probably because like, I'm still like brain dead from it. <laughs> I want to see Finding Dory eventually. Um, I want to see, it at my theater. I wanna see yeah. Swiss Army Man. Okay. <sighs> I'm so upset that we didn't get that at my mm, theater. Bummer. We're like the only theater in the area that does not have it. But yeah, it's like that. something that just screams to be I shown know, at the end. I Alamo. know. And like we had the trailer for it in front of like every single movie last month. It, Even the kids ones. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Did you hear about that theater? I think it's out in like Colorado that had the our the red band trailer for Sausage Party in front of Finding Dory. Oh, oh boy. No, but I want to now. <laughs> brilliant yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. just like animated movie throw it on there yeah right uh but yeah i mean that, that's the really... r stands for rad <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's a party <laughs> the uh <laughs> with yeah. sausages yeah everybody loves sausages yeah. totally totally i you know i had some i had some sausage or you know at that at that thing that <laughs> cookout <laughs> uh yeah um yeah if you guys got anything else to uh to throw in there nah no. I'm I'm like an hour away from buying the entirety of the uh, the Twin Peaks TV series on Laserdisc. Oh, I can't wait to marathon that oh with you. God. How much would that cost? It's about a hundred dollars. Okay, well, worth every penny. The covers are so good, mm. and Definitely what's great is this is co- this is being posted like you know two days from now, so no one's gonna be able to steal it from me by listening to this episode. Yeah, there you have it. But uh, yeah, suckers. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, be sure to check out Spread Number 14 uh, out in comic shops now. The uh, first 13 issues, the first 11 of which are collected in two volumes, you can also get now in comic shops or on Comixology. Justin Jordan will be hearing from you again very soon. Uh, This has been another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. I'm Josh. (laughs) See ya. I like to keep it ominous, I guess. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) Good night, Eric Bonner. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a new commentary every Monday. We've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.